Greetings, <laughs> Mr. Sweetwater here. Welcome to GIF 2020 online. And I have the honor, the privilege, the pleasure of having a man on the phone with me. His name is Slash. So how are you, my friend? Ah, uh, I'm okay. You know, I, I really, all things considered, I cannot complain. Well, you could, but no one would care anyway, right? I guess. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I could, but I, I'll think at this moment in time, I think there's some people who could validly complain more than I can, so I just won't complain about anything. Well said. Well said. Yeah, it's kind of it's, the last few months have been weird. I hate to quote one of your songs, but yeah, it's been shadow life. <laughs> it really has, and you know, and I named that on purpose. It's probably my favorite song on the strangely aptly titled "World on Fire" CD. Kind of got some Nostradamus in that title, I must say. So, how, how have you been? How, how have you been dealing with uh, you know this this lockdown? Have you been keeping busy? Um, you know, I mean, it's it, it's a, you know, it's so it's frustrating because we would be on the road right now, right? And you know, I'm a touring guy, so. Um, you know, the whole, the whole tour from March all the way through September, um, is obviously canceled until next year. And then we don't even know for sure what's going to happen next year. But, uh, so that was frustrating. Um, I had a, a cat who was really sick that it was sort of a blessing that I was home to be there for her, you know, Good. the whole time that she was sick. And I just had to put her down actually a few days I'm ago, sorry. but I, I would have been horrible if I had been gone and Megan was left to deal with it all on her, on her own. You know, so there was some somewhat of a blessing there and it's been good to be with the kids and just to sort of, you know, be around. But, uh, yeah, so those are the small blessings. So I don't, I, I try not to complain. I just sort of deal with it. The frustrating thing, the frustrating part about it, was being home and doing nothing but housework for a couple months. <laughs> yeah, cause I, I was because say, like, along along with Zach Wilde, you're probably the hardest working guitarist in rock. When you're not touring or recording, you're invariably collaborating with other people from often from different genres, like you know, like Nile Rodgers, BB King, yada yada. Have you been able to do any of that via technology in the lockdown, or have you just homebodied? No, um, I've, I've been pretty much a homebody, but I've been back and forth between my studio and the house and doing a lot of writing and recording on my own. And I've been jamming with Duff, and I've been jamming with Axel, and I've been doing stuff like that. Um, uh, so we've been getting some work done that way. But I haven't been doing much else. <clears throat> I haven't been doing any... <clears throat> collaborations with the odd artist and, and whatnot. Um, basically just focusing on writing new music. Cool, and, and cool. Recording demos and recording guitar stuff for, for guns and whatnot. Oh, that's that's nice to hear. Now I've got a question for you. Yeah. Like, you're, you're such a road rat, and I mean that in the nicest possible sense. Like, keeping up your chops is not an issue because like, your sets aren't exactly short. So when you're on the road, you're playing at least two hours a day. Just to keep your chops up must take some time and discipline. How do you do that? When I guess if you're recording, can you do? Does recording keep them up, or do you have to work separately to make sure you're on? Board? Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry. Excuse me. Um, recording is a good a good tool for keeping your chops up, because obviously whatever it is that you're playing has to be good enough to be able to be permanent, right? Right, yeah. Um, so that that really helps to keep your chops up. I play a lot anyway, and I'm um, spending a lot of time writing, so it just keeps it keeps me on my toes. Um, it's, not, it's, it's, uh, it's not as physical or as fast-paced um, or by the seat of your pants, so to speak, as playing live is, but, you know, I do manage to keep it all going. Right, and do do you have any sort of routine for like warming up or keeping up to keeping your your speed up or anything like that, or is it just playing a lot does that for you? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I don't have too many, you know, what you call set routines for practicing or anything. Um, I just pick up the guitar, and if I've got an idea, I explore that, and um, and I. I uh, you know, think about stuff. Maybe it might pop it in my head and get ideas here and there, and, and so I I go after them. And if I'm just noodling, then I try to come up with an idea to focus on just for for whatever it is that I'm trying to do. Um, you know, just sort of 
keep everything sort of fresh. <laughs> you know, I don't know. I just do whatever. It's hard for me to really describe it. And it's it's definitely not a um a set routine. Right. It's just what 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 happens happens. Yeah, yeah. Now I was doing some research into into this obviously talking to your good self via the phone. Thanks for doing it by the way. And the one thing I did find was a an interview with some French chap on YouTube where you actually said I don't really like going out much, that, and you are a homebody. So I guess to that end, along with you know your your sad the sad passing of your cat, this must have made the lockdown a little bit easier for you to deal with the fact that you are a homebody at heart when you're not on the road. Yeah, I, I think I've always been, um, and and it, this is an interesting uh, an interesting experience for me this at this particular moment in time because you know uh, rewind twenty years ago. <laughs> I wouldn't have handled this at well at all. <laughs> um, you know. So I've I've sort of learned how to keep myself busy and be, you know, not working if I'm forced into a situation where you know I can't tour or whatever. And I've learned how to sort of work it. But back in the day, man, this was this was the catalyst for all my drug problems. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so I'm glad this didn't didn't happen back then. But yeah, at this point, you know, it's it's definitely like. A lot of things that you would just normally do, as far as errands are concerned, are sort of out the window. But other than that, I've never been somebody who goes out socially. Gotcha. Now, something yeah. else. But I knew all about the snakes from way back when, but unbeknownst to me, you're a self-confessed hardcore horror purist, and you even have your own horror film production company, aptly named Slasher Films. Duh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That the thing that interests me is 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 even though your your production company is called Slasher Films, you're not really into that just blood, guts, and gore and horror. You're actually looking for something more psychological with character building. What was your yeah? What got you into 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 horror in the first place? Okay, well, first off, it's 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 slash films. We took the slasher part, the ER, out of it. Okay, so it's slash productions actually. Well, I will, just, I'm, I'm going to blame the Google for that. The, the, oh, no, no, Google it's okay because I haven't done anything under Slash Productions yet. So. Okay, gotcha. Okay. Um, but anyway, I I was into horror. It was like the Hammer films back when I was a kid in England. That was a I major love thing. I was always into um, you know horror movies and and creepy stuff. You know, <laughs> that was just my natural bent. Um, so I've been a, a fan of horror movies for as long as I can remember. Um, and I just, I never aspired to actually make films or make horror movies. And that's obviously not where my, I, I launched, you know, which direction, uh, trajectory my career was, but, um, I'm a huge fan. I know a lot about, uh, horror movies, how horror movies are made, thrillers, science fiction movies, whatnot. Um, and so it's at some point, I think it was in 2013, um, I was at a Halloween party and was uh, hanging out with this uh, movie producer, and we we got into this night-long horror conversation, and he told me, you know, you'd make a great producer. And I didn't really take him all that seriously. And then he called me the next day, and so we, we had a meeting, and we got into this, and we started uh, going through a bunch of scripts that he had. Um, and he goes, yeah, you, you've got you've got a real aptitude for this. And so we ended up working on a horror movie together, and it came out in I guess the following year. I've got like all these different productions in different stages of development. I've got um, probably about half a dozen of them at the moment. So oh, it's something I've been doing pretty passionately on the side of doing all the music. Gotcha. Now, what interests me is, the, is you're obviously not the only hard rocker into horror flicks. I mean, obviously Rob Zombie, John Five, and the guy you toured with, Kirk Hammett. Has, has, have you ever thought about collaborating, or have you ever discussed it with those guys? Um, I know all of them, obviously, and, yeah. and we have discussed horror, and they're they're all awesome, like you know, horror movie personalities. Right. Um, they all have their very, their own very individual tastes and stuff. And who knows if we'll ever collaborate on something? I haven't. We haven't, you know, thought about it at this point in time. I mean, Rob's got his thing, and um, and and Kirk has definitely got his thing going on. And so we haven't really. But you never know. At some point, they could all converge. You know. <laughs> yeah, you never know. And right? Something really cool could come out of it. Yeah, no, that would be exciting. Now, you, you've also done horror soundtrack work too, and that. Most recently, you did something a couple of years ago for the uh, Universal Studios Halloween Horror Night in L.A. And, um, right, right. 
And that leads me nicely into the fact that like to a lot of people, like I mean, I look at you and so do many folks as the quintessential guy with a Les Paul, a Wawa pedal, and a Marshall cranked on 11. And there you are with a Fishman triple play wireless MIDI controller guitar pickup system, um, which is kind of surprising to me. Did it surprise and shock you when you got into that, or was it a natural evolution, especially doing the sound well, work? One of the great things about producing a movie for me is that you can be um, completely involved in the scoring, which is such a major part of the whole experience for me is the score. So that's great, but you can't, not everything works on guitar, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And so so you start getting into, you know, different instruments, and I play guitar and I write on guitar, and I'll write the music for a score on guitar. And I learned that you can, you know, what I would be, I'd be working with a, a scoring composer, and he would translate my music into whatever instruments we were using for the part right. and so eventually i learned uh, you know obviously i knew about guitar synthesizers but <clears throat> i learned about the fishman uh, model that that was out at the time or you know a couple of few years ago and it was great it was like i could do a lot of different stuff as far as writing is concerned on the guitar and actually have the sound that I was looking for as opposed to having somebody translate it. So it just became really, really convenient. And then when I was doing the, the uh, Halloween Horror Nights at Universal, that that became the tool that I would use. If it wasn't a guitar sound, then I would use the, the Fishman to get the violins and the cellos and all that kind of stuff. And it worked out really great. And I'm working on a new bit for Halloween Horror Nights for this year and also for next year. And so there's a newer fisherman, fisherman, a new fishman uh, sent out at the moment. And so I've incorporated that into these new compositions. Yeah, cause so it's, it's really cool. I'm not a full on guitar synth guy to the point where you're going to hear it on any of my rock and roll records, but it works great for um, this side of me that does the scoring stuff. Yeah, the one thing that impresses me about the Fishman is it tracks really well. Like it picks it up. It tracks great. And that, I mean, that's that's more than half the battle. If you can get that part together, then then you're not interrupted all the time, and so you can focus and concentrate. And that's what's so great about them. And plus, the sounds are really good. But I mean, obviously, there's there's um, libraries of of <clears throat> plugins now with amazing instrument sounds, and you can actually incorporate that as well. Now, do you find yourself thinking or playing differently when you find a sound you like? Does that in, does that inspire you to write differently or think differently? Yeah, well, you're 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 thinking like, okay, I might write something. I mean, I think differently when I'm thinking of scoring. Anyway, right. it's just a different side of me. It's one of the things that makes it so much fun. Is it brings out a, a side of me that most of my stuff I do in bands, I don't necessarily have that kind of way of writing gotcha. um, and so it opens up a, a, a whole different avenue for me and so if you're doing something that's say on a cello it will it will influence um, how you play for sure gotcha. but gotcha. usually you have an idea beforehand or you've written something on a guitar and then when you go to do it on you know say a, val a, a violin or um, you know, a harp or something like that, then it definitely changes your approach. Gotcha. Now, do you do you normally have the instrument you're looking for in mind when you write the part and then you find it, or does it sometimes work the opposite way around? Does I have end? something in mind. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, I just since I was just doing this a couple of weeks ago, um, I definitely will have a, a melody or something, and I'll have something in mind, and I'll try it, and if it... You know, in, invariably that's what works. But sometimes I might explore other instruments if it doesn't have the desired effect, and so I'll find it in something else. Gotcha. Now, do you also use it for like percussion and drum ideas as well, or do you do that? Differently? I haven't. I haven't yet. I know it's there. I mean, this is really um, a whole other world, and I'm not. I'm not one to really um, sit down at the computer and spend a lot of time. I, I do a lot of this on the fly. Right. So yeah. I haven't gotten into the whole drums and percussion side of it, but I'm very aware of them. Right. And what door do you use? Are you using a digital audio workstation? Or? Am I do Wait, say that again. Am I doing Are you using Studio One or Pro Tools or something like that, a door? Oh, I'm using Pro Tools, yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, top, the, the hard one. 
<laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I do. My 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 expertise on Pro Tools is very limited, so I I use it basically to 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 do demos on my own. But I have a, an engineer that who's great that I work with when I need him to come by and help me get stuff recorded quickly and sent off to wherever I have to send it and whatnot. <laughs> so he's really really helpful. Now, you know, when 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 you're working on a soundtrack, you know, or even something be it for a film or, or for the maze, do you write with with regards to mood, or you're actually syncing with what's going on on screen? If that makes sense, how, how do you? Um, I, I think it's both. It's it's whatever's going on screen obviously has a a big part of it, but the mood that you're trying, to, uh, the mood that it it evokes from you when you look at it, is really what you're um, we, we're communicating. Um, on sound wise, you know, and composition wise. So you basically you're looking at something. It might be a script. You might even just read a script, but there's a feeling that comes to you, and right. that's what evokes whatever music you're going to come up with. Gotcha. Got fascinating. And on the maze thing, it's, it's going through a bunch of different movies as you go through. Are you thinking in segmentally there? Going okay, it's going to go from this vibe to this vibe. Yeah. Yeah, I, I definitely go. Um, <clears throat> there's this new one coming up. Because of the pandemic, it's not going to be this year, but or, or it's not going to be 2021. It's going to be 2022 now. No, but uh, it's it involves uh, a lot of different themes, and so I write something for each theme. But then sometimes one theme ties into another, and so you can sort of, um, you know. Uh, I'm trying to think of the right word. Um, you sort of write one part right. and it sort of bleeds into the next part and you're sort of aware of that ahead of time and you just sort of bring them all together. Right, so it's almost like a sequence or a segue. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. We all know and love Gibson guitars for their lines of, you know, Les Pauls, SGs, Flying Vs, Explorers, and also the custom shop stuff. But there's another line now that exists that a lot of people expect and look forward to every year, and it's the Slash Signature line, which is pretty impressive at this point. And i got to say, the last, the four you just came out with, the Appetite Amber, I think it's called, the November Burst, and the two limited editions, the Anaconda and the Vermilion Burst, they're right. beauties. How... How do you keep coming up with cool variations on the? I mean, you've obviously done like the Firebirds were great and the acoustics and the double neck, but you're you're synonymous with the Les Paul, but you keep managing to make them cool and different. What's your what's your approach? <laughs> um, well, I mean, I just try and do stuff that I would actually like. So the Anaconda Burst was totally just like I want. I would really love to do sort of a, a nice dark green. Les Paul, because you don't see them very often. No, it's beautiful. Um, and, you know, and then and then when we did the uh, the Vermilion, you know, I'd actually that was influenced by a guitar that I saw at Custom Shop, and I thought, you know, that, that would be really cool if it looked like this, you know. Right. And uh, and and it's it's sort of like that. The cool thing about what we've done recently is um, it's my first run of USA guitars, and now that um, you know, Gibson's under new ownership. Um, the, the guy, Cesar, who's running the show now, he and I had some meetings, and he, he is steering the country away from where it was going. Country, Not country, con the, the company away right. from where it was going and going in the direction of what all us, you know, sort of Gibson fans and Les Paul purists would have wanted, right? So he and I had some long meetings about about how the USA should really be the premier guitar that everybody's buying. It shouldn't be custom shop. I mean, custom shop should be very specific. Right. Um, but what everybody should be rushing out to get are, are Gibson USAs where the quality is just as good and it's a lesser price point and blah, blah, blah. So it's what it sh always should have been. And it, prob and it was before it started to sort of lose touch with reality over the last 10 years. Um, and so so I'm finally doing um, USA uh, slash models, which is great, and I'm, I'm really excited about it. Well, I noticed you're using custom Burst Bucker Alico 2 pickups, and then I love the punch they've got. There's, some, there's that mid-range thing which you're kind of synonymous with again, but they're not overly like high output. They're not overly no. hard. They're they're relatively I mean they're not low output but they're not high output and they tend to be just a little bit cleaner and I I only discovered those pickups um, 
you know, basically by chance when I got that uh, Chris Derrick, Les Paul, when we were recording Appetite for Destruction. Right. Um, I wasn't aware of that particular uh, model of Seymour Duncan pickups, and they work great, and I've been using them ever since, and I have them in every single guitar that I use. It doesn't matter what it is. Um, those are the pickups I put in it. If, if, if it ain't broke, right? Right, exactly. And, you know, I've experimented with different stuff, and it's just um, a lot of different pickups. I mean, like PF, PF pickups are great, you know, and uh, Seymour Duncan makes a great PF pickup. And there's a lot of different cool ones, um, you know, uh, the, uh, different kinds of burst buckers and whatnot. But um, the, the particular Alnico 2, that it's just always sounded good to me. Gotcha, gotcha. Now, last question. Oh, one thing. So, have you something up your sleeve for for the next batch of slash signatures, or is that a top secret that if you tell me, you'll have to tell me? I, well, I mean, we just we just finished this last USA batch, right? Um, and so that's great. And then we've we've you know those are out now, and it'll probably be a while before we put you know another uh, even start thinking about another run. But there is a gold top coming out. Ooh. Um, so it should be coming next year. Nice, nice. Now, last question, I promise, and thanks so much for taking the time. And this is a very selfish question. Um, I have the good fortune to teach guitar at Sweetwater, and one of my goals with my pupils is, well, first goal is to make them have fun and keep interest in, keep interest in playing, but also to, to improve their picking skills and get used to, to moving up and down the neck horizontally as opposed to vertically so they're not stuck in a box. And I kind of want to do it without a boring digital exercise. And I have to say, thank you, thank you, thank you for writing Anastasia, because that opening <laughs> is one of the best exercises ever. And the thing is, the old, be they young or old, everyone loves it because it's musical. And I thought huh. the thing that it's so, you know, it ticks all the boxes in my teaching curriculum. The kids leave with a smile on their face because they're playing slash stuff and it sounds great. But my question to you is, the underlying chords which are played and which were implied by that wonderful ascending then descending line you play, what came first, the lead line, like the melody line, or the chords? The lead line came first, and it was actually sort of tricky to figure out what the chords were, you know, because um, there's a lot of sort of music theory behind that. Right. Um, <laughs> but uh, the, the melody just came, actually, uh, truth be known, it it was something I stumbled on during a guitar solo um, back in, I guess it was uh, 2011 or something. And, uh, and it was just something that I did during during uh, whatever the guitar solo was, extended guitar solo back then. It was probably before Sweet Child of Mine or something. And, uh, and so I, I dug it and I, I tried to remember what it was the next day and it became just something fun for me to do during the guitar solo to sort of piece this, this idea together. And so that's really where it came from. It was just an extended, an extension of one of my guitar solos. Cause, cause it's, cause it's, it's, it's melodic yet chromatic. That's what fascinates me. It, it ascends chromatically and then descends pretty much chromatically. But thanks to the chord voicings and also the interesting way you're playing it. And the thing I love is the fact that like, like it, once, once a pupil and myself gets, gets used to a pattern, you subtly change it. Was, was, was that something intentional or is it just something you heard? No, it's just it was just something I heard, and and trying to melodically get it to sound right meant that it w there wasn't a set pattern because as you change from major to minor or something, you know things move around just by a note, half tap, half half step here, half step there. But uh, in order to, for to sound right for me melodically, I had to actually sort of trip around trying to find where to play the notes and so on, you know. Was there some trial and error involved in that final decision, or did it just kind of evolve naturally, if that makes sense? Did it what in the final decision? Was it, was it, was, was it an element of experimentation, trial and error, or did, it, or did it naturally evolve into what it became? I, I guess it's sort of both. I mean, it naturally evolved just from playing it, you know, in the middle of a guitar solo every night and discovering notes as I did it. Um, and then when I finally sat down to, to put it together as part of a song, then I really did have to sort of fine tune where it was going and how long it was going to be and all that kind of right, stuff. Right, right. But I, I sort of inherently had an idea in my mind as to what it was going to be. 
Gotcha. You know? And my last question is, how hard, and this is the last one I promised, so I just lied to you before, because this is, that was the second <laughs> question. How long did it take, how hard was it to find those chord inversions? Because they're really cool. And it's almost, it's very classical sounding, dare I say. It's really... It is very classical. I, I think I, I, I'm pretty influenced by classical modes. You know, I really have a thing for sort of minor stuff, and then especially where where you're moving chords from minor to major and whatever happens. But it is very classical sounding. Um, and the chords were, um, you know, I mean, I, I did it in one sitting. But it, you know, it took some focus, and, and you know there was different variations of what kind of chords could be used for a particular note. So it had to be melodic as well. But you just sort of sit there and figure it out. Yeah, because the cool thing is that actually stands up by itself as an exercise as well, which is well not as an exercise. Well, it, it is. It's like learn learn how to play this because it's cool and hard, but sounds great. So put... <laughs> I, I do remember pretty well <laughs> t- teaching it to to, to Todd. And, and Miles when we were about to record that record, <laughs> right? You know, because it, it it was it, you know with, it, it's one of those kind of things where you're sort of like okay to get the pattern to remember it from from the beginning of the 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 lick all the way to the end and to remember exactly where all the chords are. It's a little bit of a a, a, a brain teaser. Oh, it's great! It's wonderful. So, well, listen, my friend. Thank you so much for taking the time. Hopefully, I will see you in one of your natural habitats, which is on stage very soon. I'm sure everyone wants to see that again. But uh, thanks for taking the time, and glad everything's good despite what we're going through. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, it's it's a crazy, crazy time. It's definitely one for the books. But I've definitely been. It's been a good creative time. Um, so that's another one of the blessings about it. It's, it's just sitting down and being patient and just actually, you know, writing and not feeling rushed about it and not doing it so much as on the fly, you know, which I normally do. So it's been, it's been a good creative period and something good will come out of it, you know? Yeah, no, definitely. It's definitely t- time to make lemonade out of the lemon. <laughs> and it, exactly. sounds, it, it sounds like you've done it. So I look forward to hearing what you've created and, uh, like I said, my friend, thank you so much for taking the time. We really appreciate it. Oh, man. No, it's good to, good to talk to you, man. I'm glad you're doing well. And I will see you around at some point in the not too distant future. Wonderful stuff. Slash you. <laughs> right, thank you so much, my friend. Yeah, no worries. I'll Bye. talk to you later. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye.